This is uh, my kitchen table and also my filing system. Over much of the past three decades, I've been an investor. The highest calling of mankind, I've often thought, was private equity. <laughs> and then I started interviewing. Well, I watch your interview because I know how to do some interviews. <laughs> I've learned in doing my interviews how leaders make it to the top. I asked him how much he wanted. He said 250. I said fine. I didn't negotiate with him. I did no due diligence. Told I have me. something I'd like to sell. <laughs> and how they stay there. You don't feel inadequate now because being only the second wealthiest man in the world. Is that right? <laughs> Nubar Afayan is an incredible entrepreneur, a parallel entrepreneur. He starts many companies in the biotech area at the same time. One of those companies is Moderna, a company now famous for having created the vaccine that dealt with the coronavirus pandemic. I sat down in Boston with Nubar to hear more about the success of Moderna and what he plans to do in the future in other biotech areas. When you came up with the idea of Moderna, did you ever in your wildest dreams think that it would change the world in the way that it has? Absolutely not. Um, what we had thought of was that we might well have the next generation of biotechnology uh, and something that had never been even dreamt before, which was the body's own ability to make its own drugs, whatever it needed. So the notion would be we would introduce a molecule that would code for the drug that we want, and the body would in turn translate and make the drug that it needs. That was the basic idea, which was itself a fantasy at the beginning. In other words, an act of imagination with relatively little proof. That platform would go on to create 20 different products that were being tested in the clinic when this pandemic hit was something we could envision. But the pandemic itself and the ability for this technology to be used overnight to fight against this very nasty virus that we could that we did not imagine. When you come up with an idea for a company like Moderna, do you then go get somebody to be the CEO? Do you get somebody to be on the board? How does it work when you start a company? So our process of starting companies, which is what my company, Flagship Pioneering, does prof institutionally, professionally, if you will, we don't start with an idea for the company. We start with a range of things that we could pursue, of which we try to find which one actually gains advantage and goes forward. So Moderna followed the same exact process we have, which is we ask questions that start with what if. So in this case, it was what if we could make a code molecule that when introduced to the body could make any medicine we wanted. With that question, the question is, how do you do that? Is there a way to do that that's been tried? What gets in the way? How, how reliable is it? There's all these questions ahead. And so we don't start the company based on the question. We start an exploration, which is what we did. So in the summer of 2010, we began to explore these issues. Is it even possible? Sometimes I've likened it to kind of an archaeological dig, except of the future, not of the past. You kind of pick up pieces and you look, is there value here? Is there value there? So we, st we in the lab setting, we started doing experiments. Now, as we went forward, we started realizing that there was actually a path that we could at least point to forward to be able to make this mRNA molecule. And once we get to a stage where it begins to be clear that there's some intellectual property there, that's when we actually say, okay, how are we going to actually create a team to lead it, and what's the leadership structure with a CEO? Now the company has a market value that's greater than Merck's. It's a market cap of about $190 plus billion. dollars. Uh, when you first invested in, how much money did you put into Moderna? Well, we capitalized the first couple of years of the company's existence. So altogether, my firm deployed about $11 million to stand up the company over a period of a couple of years. And that $11 million has has a return of infinite amount, practically? No, uh, well north of a thousandfold, but yes. So when Moderna was moving forward and coming up with the idea of coming up with this vaccine that's helped in the pandemic, um, what did the CEO say to you? Did he say, I think I've got the way to really cure the pandemic? Or what did you say to him? Well, when the, the beginnings of this pandemic were beginning to show themselves, this was back January of 2020, uh, we had a discussion about the possibility of starting a program just to be in a position in case this got serious. And, and interestingly, the, go the reason was not because it was a pandemic. It was not a pandemic at the time. There was, nobody was using that word. But because we thought we'd have an opportunity to also demonstrate one of the hidden advantages of our platform, which was just speed. 
speed of execution, speed of design. See, in the traditional biotech pharmaceutical world, speed is hardly ever an advantage because things take such a long time in being approved and regulated that going even faster often doesn't really result in much of a gain. Whereas in a pandemic or epidemic we thought we would have, speed becomes the, a, a life or death difference. And so that's what attracted us at first. And then, of course, the situation caused us to put a lot of our efforts into this. Hey, but Moderna was a relatively small company. Very few people heard of it. You go to the government of the United States and say, guess what, forget Merck, forget Pfizer, forget all these other companies, give us some money. Did they laugh at you at the time? And they said, well, who ever heard of you? Or was it clear that they were so interested in anything that they gave you money that you needed? Um, it's more the second, but even more, we were well known in all the circles in the government. From the beginning of this effort, we partnered with NIH. The NIH was testing our vaccine in humans 40 days after we actually started our process. So it wasn't that they laughed at us from a point, of course they were worried that how can a company that we don't know withstand this type of uh, um, capital slash importance, if you will, how can it scale up quickly? So a lot of unknowns. Good news for us. Starting with Stefan and the team he had assembled, they were all stars from all the major pharma companies. So when it was hard to get, um, did people call you up all the time in the middle of the night and say, guess what, can you get me some of the Moderna or did you uh, unlist your phone number or something? I did get calls that I never thought I would ever get before from many, many country leaders. What did you say? They got me. I, the reality is I couldn't do anything. I was completely, I mean, nobody could do anything legally. The entire vaccine supply was a possession of the U.S. government, the, the ones we were making in the U.S. It had not been authorized for any other use than emergency use. So any supply kind of un, under the table, if you will, would be an illegal act. I, in fact, told many people that I would more readily get an assault rifle here than I could a vaccine because it was completely illegal to do anything with it. So I, I just, I, it, it was very difficult for me to understand because they viewed it as oh, it's an innovation, surely you must have some lying around. And people don't realize just how carefully governed this whole thing was. And in a way it made it a bit easier for us to be honest with you because had we been able to do this, the demand was in the hundreds of thousands of demands, not one or two. So the efficacy is around 93.5% or something like that, which means that if you get it, you have a pretty good chance of not getting the virus, right? That's right. But now the Delta variant has come along, and presumably there are going to be other variants. Is uh, the Moderna vaccine going to be working against that, or do you have a something just for the Delta variant? We are, as technology developers, preparing for any eventuality including looking at what our baseline vaccine after two doses does, which so far six months data we have available is very, very robust. We haven't seen any real deterioration of our protection. That's first. Against the Delta virus, we have very strong protection and we expect that will continue for a period of time. The problem is we don't know for how long because you find out when your guard is down after your guard is down. So in order to prepare for that eventuality, we have begun to make variant vaccines, vaccines that have different sequences that if needed, we could accelerate so that we can actually use that. So I think we're gonna work very closely with regulators, FDA, CDC here and, and the Europeans, to figure out from an arsenal of, the beauty about the mRNA technology is that we can actually do this type of rapid response versus conventional biotechnology that takes years and years to do the same thing. Well, to get to the heart of the problem, my own personal situation, so I got two uh, Moderna shots. Do I need a booster shot? I think that the best advice so far is that people uh, after a certain age, and I cannot tell you right now what that age cutoff will be because that will be set by the government, are most likely going to need a booster to be well protected against the variant. And over time, again, public health officials are going to have to decide if everybody should get a booster shot. My guess is that given enough time, we may well end up in a situation where we have yearly, let's say at a minimum yearly vaccinations, just like the flu. So Tony Fauci has said that we should use this example of what happened with the coronavirus to prepare for other potential viruses down the road and that hopes companies like yours will do that. Are you working on that kind of thing in now already? Or? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. A very big part of Moderna's future will be in being the leading vaccine developer, but also with mRNA technology, but also additional new technologies that we're considering to augment our capability. But I should also say that within the broader flagship pioneering context, which is where I operate, we have multiple projects as well looking to expand the security net for future pandemics.
as we talk today, we're in Boston, and it's probably not a surprise that many people would say that people from MIT or Harvard were involved in Moderna. But your background is different than many people who are at MIT and Harvard. You did not grow up in this country, is that correct? That's right. So I was born in uh, Lebanon, Beirut, Lebanon, of Armenian parents. Lived there till the Civil War in 1975 and ended up escaping the Civil War and growing up in Montreal, Canada. So you were a teenager when you went to uh, Canada? Was a teenager and I was extremely fortunate, my family was, that they took us with basically as political refugees. We escaped Lebanon. Yes, so you went to McGill University? I did. And what did you major in? Chemical engineering, which was an interesting uh, field at the time because that's the field that first got drawn into biotechnology when that industry started. Okay, so after you graduated, you then went to MIT? Yes, I was the first graduate from the, by what was called the Bioprocess Engineering Center. It was the first time engineers were being trained to really do kind of advanced work in biology. And the notion was this new industry was being born, and so you needed engineers to come up with how to make the products. That's how I got involved. And were there a lot of Armenians in this MIT program? <laughs> I don't think there'd been Armenians in the MIT for many, many years. There'd been some, but no, it was not. I was not surrounded by familiar uh, faces. Right, when you got your PhD, were you going to go teach, which is what sometimes people do with PhDs and that, or did you want to go into industry? And what did you decide to do? Well, it was an interesting time. I've reflected on it quite a bit because, uh, in, because this was a new field, and I've since realized that's how kind of advanced education systems work, the most prestigious thing would have been for me to go teach. And here was a field in, which didn't exist, biochemical engineering, and so I could go teach anywhere. I mean, this was a, they needed people who came, you know, who were proficient in this. Um, I did not really seriously uh, think about that. Personality-wise, kind of what I saw a lot of the professors doing, I just felt that this was not my temperament, basically. Uh, by the way, I've since, because I've taught at MIT and Harvard Business School courses, I've since realized that education itself, higher education has changed so much that you can be an entrepreneur and be a, a faculty member at the same time. Back in 85, 83, that was not the case. So that, that's, that was not something I pursued. The choices then were join a large pharmaceutical company, with just beginning to hire people who were engineers in this field. Uh, and then what I ended up doing by a, a chance encounter I had with somebody is actually decide to start a company, which was extremely rare back in the mid to late 80s, let alone for a 24-year-old immigrant with zero experience. Was your family say, get a real job, don't start oh, a company? I, I, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, even though my father was an entrepreneur in the more trade, you know, import-export type of entrepreneur, but, but it was definitely the risk was throwing away the, the education and the brand. All right, so you started a company when you were 24 years old? Yes. And how did that company do? Company uh, failed to fail, and therefore it succeeded eventually in becoming the largest instrument company in, uh, in the biotech field at the time, which was the, the late 1995-7 uh, time frame. Uh, we invented a number of new technologies that could be used to study and, and make proteins, and we grew to about 110 million in revenues, about 900 people. It was a public company for a number of years. Lots of ups and downs, lots of learnings, but it was for the, for the period uh, ultimately a successful adventure. So you sold it to Perkin Elmer eventually? Yes. And so you cashed out, you got a lot of money for a young person. Uh, did you say I'm going to retire now or just go teach or just relax? What did you decide, decide to do? It was a little more complicated because I had along the way in the last few years started, co-started, co-founded a number of other companies. So between 94 and 97 I'd been involved as a co-founder of four other companies. Each of them went public, three of them got sold. And so actually in a way it was worse than just doing one thing and then kind of calling it a day because I had now also sampled doing multiple things and, and instead actually, so I did not consider retiring but one thing I did realize is that doing yet another company wasn't going to accomplish much just because you know, I was not drawn into this notion of being a serial entrepreneur. And so that's kind of when I started thinking about ideas that have led me to do what I do now which is I, in the mid-90s I got enamored with this notion of parallel entrepreneurship. Uh, and at the time, that was not even a thing, even now probably it isn't. But the notion of parallel entrepreneurship was, why can't you simultaneously think about, deeply about 
major new innovations and organizing companies all at the same time. I was doing it individually by partnering with different folks, and that led to institutional versions. The norm would be serial entrepreneuring, where you right. start a company, you finish it, and then go on the next one. You're doing several at the same time. Yes. It's not unlike what Elon Musk is doing. He has SpaceX, and he's also uh, right. got Tesla. Yes, 20, 30 think. years later, yes. So when did you start raising funds where people could give you money to invest, and you would then invest in various biotech ventures? When did you start doing that? So since 2000, we have operated a series of funds some of which has been my capital, increasingly so even in the larger ones now. And, and, and the reason we did it that way, it was very interesting, was that our idea was to deploy the funds exclusively to companies that we conceive create the science of which we generate. So as, um, as opposed to the typical investment deal flow, diligence, select the winners, et cetera, we don't have any of that. Whatever projects make it through our system, get capital and they get advanced. If I had been lucky enough to know you in 2000 when you raised your first fund and I put a million dollars in, how much would I have made by now? I don't, we, I don't have a, a simple answer to that, but I'd say it's safe to say that over the last 15 years we've, we've operated north of 30% in that RR across everything we've done. Okay, so recently you went out and raised a new fund, $3.4 billion, and that money came from individuals from all over the world, institutions who who beg you to come in and did you turn people away? We did have to turn some folks away but we were very very pleased with the interest we got. Much of the capital came from investors we've had for well over a decade but some of it was also new. These are endowments, uh, large large pension funds in this country I'm happy to say we probably represent the best, the best investment multiple states have made. It's up to them to say so but I know their I know their results and it makes me proud. Look as an immigrant it does make me proud to have a state in some place actually feel good about what we've been able to generate for their own people. You've had a great achievement with Moderna. Do you think you can do anything as great as that in the future? Well, we're saying we can generate an engine that can produce companies that might be a Moderna or 10 times a Moderna or a tenth of a Moderna. A lot of companies in Silicon Valley, and I guess in the Boston area as well, Boston, Cambridge, are started by immigrants. Maybe they are harder working, maybe they're trying to prove something. Have you observed that many companies are immigrant founded? Well, t uh, factually they are, the majority uh, in, in by different counts, certainly in the, in the Silicon Valley area. And I've been involved in various discussions, certainly over a few years ago, when the political environment was quite against uh, immigration, uh, even of talent. Uh, but, but indeed, it, it is the case that um, there's a lot of immigrants who tend to get to the cutting edge or frontiers of things, whether it's because there's things to prove or by nature they're taking very little for granted and, and, and therefore they're comfortable with the discomfort. You know, when, if you change countries, let alone forcibly, it's, you really don't have much time to say what's owed to me and, and how come I got disadvantaged. I mean, these are all privileges of rooted people. If you're unrooted or uprooted, you don't actually, you need roots to feel like you're entitled. That is a completely connected concept. Now sometimes when you have a great success in life in whatever area it might be, it's hard to do it a second time because it's rare that somebody has a second great achievement. You've had a great achievement with Moderna, which really uh, did incredible things to help save the world uh, from the pandemic in many ways. Do you think you can do anything as great as that in the future? So, so David, what matters more to me even than the one instance is to actually create, and that's what Flagship's all about, is we're an experiment in whether you could institutionally make breakthrough innovations with huge impact, regardless of what field we're in, and to create companies that can realize that impact. If we could do that systematically over and over and over again, that is such a defiant thought to conventional wisdom that says rare things only happen rarely. Well, we're saying we can generate an engine that can produce companies that might be a Moderna or 10 times a Moderna or a tenth of a Moderna. Moderna itself was not kind of what our design goal. Moderna was the result of a process that we had already operated multiple times. Moderna was called LS18 when it was born. It was the 18th set project we've done. We're now on number 88. And in terms of projects that are born exactly the same way. Sometimes people say, well, I don't like to see people be too successful 
and therefore, can you make people feel better by saying, oh, you failed at something, have any of your companies not worked out, and you just said, this is not going to work, and I just write it off, or that ever happened? Many, many of them, many, many of them, and, and in our case, quite a bit differently than it's an investment, so therefore I write it off and I move on. I can't write it off. We own the ent entire entity, so we can't wash ourselves from a particular company. Look, maybe I'll step back and say very quickly, what we're about, the reason we use the word pioneering, is we leap into things that are not yet known to be viable, and we try to make them real. So this leaping, inevitably, you leap to places where there's no value. Now let's suppose um, we're going forward, take it, leave vaccines out for a moment. Uh, what are the one or two or three things that you're most interested in trying to do in biotech that's gonna make my life better, other people's life better? Anything that make me live longer, uh, live healthier, avoid uh, cancers, anything like that? One major theme that, we, that inspires us and that we're doing a number of things in is broadly what we call preemptive medicine or health security. And what we mean by that is that we, we observe that what we call today healthcare is really a euphemism for sick care. And the way you know that is because you gotta get sick to get any of it. But, and other than that, there's fitness and living a good life. But in between, we now know scientifically that the beginnings of disease go way before we know we have a disease. And if we could intervene at that time, and delay or completely deter the disease, then we have a very different healthcare cost challenge, let alone a lifestyle. Currently, there's no way of developing products for that, for that field because the FDA doesn't regulate it, they, don't, they won't let you do it, their insurance won't reimburse it. They need a good disease, let alone a really advanced one, to do their thing. We have to change that mindset. So how, how can flagship contribute to this and we're doing this? We started five different platform companies that attack that whether it's through like better early detection tests or whether it's creating new types of vaccines that protect even before there's a threat. All of those things are all trying to create an environment where governments and other corporations start doing that. Now, today, the average person, I'd say lifespan is maybe in the mid 80s or something like that. Uh, do you think it's possible through things that you might develop to live to 100 or 110 or 20 or is that a good or bad thing? I think it's possible. I'm not so sure it's a good thing, let alone in a planet that's dying. Uh, and so I think that we have to think of our existence not as individuals any more than our, our hepatocytes in our liver don't think of whether they're going to live. They think of whether your whole body is going to live. If we don't start thinking of whether our society is going to live and our planet is going to live, then it's a moot point as to whether we as individuals live to 110 or 100. So I think there's going to be this rec reckoning that we've got to create an environment within which it's worth living. Did your parents live to see your success? My parents saw a success uh, back in, my, I lost my parents in the late 90s, early 2000s. They saw a far greater success than they would have ever imagined or wanted. Uh, they didn't see the most recent few years, let alone the last tw uh, 12 months. But I, I know that they felt that the decisions they made on behalf of their children, particularly moving us to North America and giving us the kind of opportunity this country gave us, as, as having been more than uh, validated. So what keeps you motivated? You're obviously wealthy by any normal human standard. Uh, you could retire tomorrow and be famous for what you did with uh, Moderna, among other things. What keeps you motivated to work so hard and keep doing all these things and not spending your money on lavish kind of toys that often rich people like to buy? I really do think that we've seen the beginnings of a startup industry in this country that has revolutionized the world. I think the next few decades, that industry will become professionalized, institution, institutionalized, and will do in the creativity world what institutional investors did in the financial world. And I'm drawn to being one of the pioneers of that. If I can show one way of doing it, organizationally, kind of just methodologically, and that leads to companies that do this for a living, that interests me as, as a lasting impact. Of course, the fact that every single thing we work on has societal impact. You know, people tell us, what's your social impact strategy? 100% of everything we work on, either through health or agriculture, has societal impact. And so that keeps me, so what draws me and what keeps me interested are two different things. <laughs>